Now, when we go into the epidural injections, this becomes very important when you start doing uh, this sodium chloride injection. What, when you inject the contrast, this is the 5 ml of contrast, how far is it going? It is going up to pretty high levels, even with a caudal. So, when you inject 30 cc of local anesthetic or 30 cc of sodium chloride solution mixed with local anesthetic, that is going to have some type of therapeutic effect there. You can't call that placebo. When you do the transferominal epidural, you put the needle in the nerve sheath and inject the sodium chloride solution. It is going to alter the dynamics. Actually, there are studies which show that. When you do the interlaminar epidural, the same thing happens. You can have the big flow. So if you inject the sodium chloride or whatever, the other thing is we are missing the differences. There are differences between caudal, lumbar interlaminar, transforaminal. Translaminar is a misnomer, but they continue to use in overall the literature. And pathologies, how the patient responds with the different pathology. They included about uh, 25 studies in their analysis. So we went ahead and looked at the systematic reviews again, and uh, of course, we didn't agree with some of them, and we did agree with some of them. So actually, in therapeutic interventions, we agreed with their analysis in almost half the time, I think. So the issue is they kept using studies which are like Dashfield at all. This study, Bush Hiller, Dashfield. The study is looking at endoscopic adhesiolysis compared to caudal epidural injections. It is not a placebo control. It is, at best, an active control design. But they kept using it for both. It is a good caudal study. And for caudal purposes, it showed very good response. It didn't show good response for the people with, when you put the scope in, when they don't have anything wrong. It doesn't work. It causes trauma. There are the Jahar that is so poorly done study, even according to their criteria, 3 by 11. And with our scoring, actually, we gave him a little bit better scoring than they did. They used 30 cc of sodium chloride solution. So on the surface, it just looks like it is just a good placebo control study. They also the, they came up with this 30 cc by adding 4% mephivacaine, 2 ml, plus 28%, 28 cc of sodium chloride solution. So that is a dilute local anesthetic. It is not a placebo. If you reanalyze this, uh, if you take the new studies, of course, they were not available at their time in, in their defense. And even if you take the old studies, the evidence will be somewhat different for lumbar disc herniation. We should have fair evidence for lumbar disc herniation and radiculitis. With the new studies, probably it could be better with their own criteria. Post-surgery syndrome, at the time of their evaluation, there was nothing. So they're appropriate with the fair evidence, or poor evidence. But with the new evidence, probably it can be fair. Spinal stenosis could be fair with the new studies. Discogenic pain, it was poor. There is no question about it. It could be fair with the new studies. Lumbar interlaminar epidural injections, we agree with that. There was not evidence. Based on the evidence, there was nothing there to prove that they do work. So, Transferominal epidural injections, they gave a poor evidence, but if you look at the methodologic quality and all the systematic reviews and everything, I think it would be fair. Percutaneous lumbar epidural adhesiolysis, they didn't even discuss this in the spine article about non-surgical non therapies. Also, they didn't calculate properly the quality assessment, in our opinion. And there has been a lot of significant literature afterwards. One of the main issues they said was this uh, 
Manch Khan had all this my study, I think. They said it was a good study. Maybe not that one. Yeah, reference 117. They actually gave a pretty good score for that and everything, but they said study didn't show any placebo effect, so that was not good. But it did show placebo effect. Look at this 117. The group which received only caudal epidural injection in the first three months, 33% of them reported significant improvement, significant pain relief. So it is all interpretation how you do it. But later on, we published other studies which were not available at the, their evaluation time. 33% at three months, and they continued to, it is 0% in one study, and in other study, they actually 12% at six months, and 4% at 12 months. So it did work in some of them. Intraarticular, medial branch blocks, there are lots of issues here. You can't have a placebo here. You don't know what the effects are in the hall at all, and they did several studies. You can inject into the disc, affect the facet joints, and inject the facet joint, affect the pain of the discogenic origin. So it is a complex phenomenon. So if you want to really have a good placebo design, you have to be away from there, inject the same amount of solution, whatever you are injecting, or the sodium chloride solution. You have to do it properly. That is not being done. Therapeutic facet joint interventions, they missed one study here. And we do have a two-year follow-up with good outcome results. Oh, this is uh, still quality criteria. Now, again, the therapeutic facet joint interventions, there are a lot of reviews now there. So intraarticular injections, we agree with them. There is no evidence. For medial branch blocks, therapeutic facet joint interventions, there is good evidence. This article, which was already ex in existence at the time of their publication, was missed. Then we go into the facet joint interventions with the radio frequency neurotomy, these are a lot of issues there with the way they calculated everything. If I have chance, I will show in the, my next slides. But spinal cord stimulation, they gave fair evidence. NICE actually gave better evidence than them, and we agree with that. These are without much evidence. Uh, now that part is done. Am I doing the second part? Or? What? Well, just let me finish the first one. Well, I'm going to go ahead and give my closing statement like in a Supreme Court, I'm arguing their case, so I have to make a good case for myself now. <laughs> Is this the second portion? Okay, we'll talk about I think evidence-based medicine and the Constitution are pretty similar. They have a lot of similarities. Constitution is not an instrument for the government to restrain the people. It is an instrument for the people to restrain the government. So EBM is not an instrument for non-coverage and cost savings for academic or financial interest. It is an instrument to provide current best treatments. The Constitution is a written instrument. As such, its meaning does not alter. EBM should represent middle-of-the-road approach to the problem that allows for a wide variance in practice, style based upon the practitioner's clinical expertise and experience. So Dr. Chow showed us uh, all these uh, discussions. Uh, we have, we, I know we are a very young specialty and everything, but we can't survive. There won't be anything after several years if we just go ahead and remove everything. So you can do anything you want to. This is how they pulled the results in this. Uh, I don't know how to s say that word. Kuyama, Kuyama. <laughs> Their population is 562 feet above sea level, 2150, established in 1951. The total is 4663. <laughs> 
So there are four aspects to lack of integrity. One is the prepossession. We can be accused of the same thing. The mental phenomenon whereby when we seek the evidence of our pre preconceptions, we find it. Vagary, the obsessive pursuit of a particular conclusion, decided upon early whatever the contrary evidence. Rationalization, the intellectual art of piecing together valid evidence in a such a way as to produce an invalid conclusion. Congeniality of conclusion, whereby we reach the conclusion we like rather than one dictated by evidence and logic. I just want to show you an example of ASC EBM, how the federal government or CMS, all these organizations function. Recently they allocated $50 million to control infection in ambulatory surgery centers. So this resulted in a cost increase of twenty to $100,000 for each center. So there are like 6,000 centers across the country. The ASCs contribute to 1% of Medicare budget. Infection control constitutes approximately probably 5%, I guess. So they are spending on a $250 million expenditure to enforce 50 million per year and then increasing the cost of operation by 500 million. So everybody's margin is gone. Based on what? They want you to not to use Omnipec on multiple patients. This is the type of evidence they have. Hepatitis, unsafe injection practices in endoscopy clinic. How does that affect interventional pain management? Bloodstream infection in outpatient hematology and oncology practice. Transmission of hepatitis in outpatient settings. These are all propofol. They were using propofol on different patients with the same needles. This was company where the betamethasone was made. So this is leading us to, into all these expenses. Okay, I think we don't have time. He's getting on my case here. Professional affiliations also constitute a conflict of interest. Practice specialization, reimbursement incentives, intellectual preconceptions, previously stated positions, professional recognition, academic advancement. Each systematic review, I don't know who gave that number. Did you give that number, Dr. Chow? 300 to 400 per systematic review? So each systematic review that costs, how can you afford those things? 